Last time I showed you the awesomeness of a rearing sauropod in the 1 to 35 Halonku Sauro Poseidon, the striped brown version. Unfortunately, my blue got separated, so I couldn't even give you a sneak preview, but today we can take a full look. Now since we've gone through a lot in the first video, let's just get right in without gilding any lilies. The sculpt is the same as the stripe, so the paint application is the differentiator, and man it is quite something to behold. The overall scheme is a cool dappled blue-grey camouflage, with a warm flesh-coloured underside. You still get a sense of stripes, for example in the neck and tail, but when you zoom in, you see there's a lot going on in terms of complexity. And you can imagine how effectively the mottling breaks up the silhouette. Now for some reason, the word cloudy comes to mind when I look at this. Perhaps it's the colours, or how the patches and patterns come together. So let's take a closer look, starting at the head. Now the first thing that catches your eye is the bulging nasal tissue, which this time flashes orange brightly and proudly, serving notice to rivals, females and enemies alike. The brown at its base ties into the rest of the colour, and here you already start to see how various browns, purples and blues are mixed together. And here from the front, you can imagine how alarming or attractive that orange bulge might look from the front. The eyes are again carefully painted, and the detail in the teeth and the mouth are just as pleasing as we saw in the stripe. While we're here, you'll notice that the dermal spines are of a similar colour, but tipped with points of orange. Now, some areas look more naturally applied than others. You also see those beautifully complex blends of blues, blacks, and even a bit of lavender. Now, this mix is present in the rest of the animal in different degrees, which against the light colour, um, I want to say it's almost a white, is very striking feeling almost ethereal at times. As we go down, you'll also notice the introduction of black speckles, though at first rather muted. This lends another layer of patterning, and increases the complexity of the pattern. But what's coolest is that dorsally, you see an infusion of a lavender colour. It's very faint, but very definitely present, and adds a beauty to an already complex paint job. Now going down the right side, and here you'll see that detail comes out really clearly, especially over the whiter areas. In these patches, you see how the subtle blends create a very diffused appearance, almost like you have a um, pigment bleeding outward from a central focus. Very pleasing to look at. I could have used a fainter application of those black speckles. Going still further down, you also see how the black dots are getting a little stark in places. You see the blues come in more strongly now. Another angle showing more of the white areas, and how clearly the details come out. Now I know I spend quite a bit of time looking at the neck, but it's after all a very significant part of the entire body. And from the dorsal view, you can see clearly how, while before we had infusions of lavender in the white, here we see how we have more blue diffused in. And with a mix of both dark and very light blues, the whole thing just really is much bluer than some of the other Haolongku blues. And the effect is so harmonious. I've been carried away with the colour, but of course the detail is also exemplary. And here you see the black dots reinforce the dark of the blues. The same detail we saw in the stripe is here, though I'd say they are harder to make out in some regions compared to the stripe. But what you'll see as we look closer is a delightful mix of not just the blue, grey and white, but also actual blends of cobalt blue, Prussian blue, and various shades in between. And this is one colour variant Haolongku calls blue, which is really obviously so. Now, while some of these black spots are starker, 
others really do have smoother transitions, but I'd say that collectively, this is a case where these embellishments complement and even reinforce a very wonderful paint application as opposed to detracting and even ruining it. In the shoulder now, and here I feel that the black stippling borders on being intrusive. The detail is of course there, but because of the dark colours, some of those unesthetic features like those ulcerated osteoderms aren't as clear to see. Now, you'll still see cracks, but because of the colour, it's not actually as obvious. Perhaps all this beautiful layering of colour just keeps your attention. And just the once over now of the arm, the forearm, and the hands, and then the thighs, the legs, and the feet. There are those cracks again, unfortunately. Uh, some more cracks here. The base of the tail now. The dermal spines make their reappearance. And wow, I really love the infusion of that very faint blue hue. And going down now, look at those finer scales. This time, Halongku again has that colour accented tail tip. But because it's a yellow instead of their ubiquitous orange, and how great the alternating dark blue and yellow bands look, I'm happy. The underside is a kind of flashy orange, and pretty much continues throughout the animal. So much for the blue Sora Poseidon. Overall, it's a true beauty of a paint application. Just all those beautiful hues mixed together. This is how I would have liked the blue Diplodocus to be more like and compound that with a very cool pose that looks exciting, novel, and simply just damn awesome in a large 1-35 to sauropod. This variant is easily my favourite of the two, but as with all their models, whichever one you'll get will definitely grow on you, and you probably won't have cause for regret. So that's it for the model itself. So, Sora Poseidon has often been called the tallest sauropod ever. That's no small claim, given how miserable remains for huge sauropods tend to be, and that the holotype is only a few cervicals. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, so how'd that happen? In very rough terms, I see it as a story in three parts. Now, this is just an overview, so I'll be skipping a lot of technical details. Sora Poseidon was first described in 2000 by no less a personage than Dr. Matt Weddle, as well as his team. The holotype consists of four cervical vertebrae, which seem like precious little on which to build a sauropod, but even these vertebrae told a fascinating story. They were so huge, they were thought to be petrified wood, which gives you an idea of their size. Now first, I should say, to avoid confusion, that if you read the paper, the material for Brachiosaurus reference, HMN S2, has since been reassigned to Giraffa Titan. So all mention of Brachiosaurus pre-2009 pertains to Giraffa Titan. The vertebrae are extremely elongate, up to 1.4 meters or 4.6 feet. Now, what was assumed to be C8 is reported to be about 25% longer than Giraffa Titan, but interestingly, it's also only 10 to 15% larger in diameter, suggesting a more gracile animal. As for the cervical ribs, the longest was 3.42 meters, 11.2 feet which is almost 20% longer than Giraffa Titans, 
and you see how it spans several adjacent vertebrae. How they identified the cervical number is also interesting. In Giraffa Titan, there's a transition point in the cervicals, where the neural spine goes from relatively low in C6 to very obviously higher in C7. It just so happens that in the four cervical vertebrae of Sauro Poseidon, you have low neural spines in these two cervicals. There's a definite higher one here. And this one is broken off, but the authors give reasons why they believe it to be similarly high. Hence, just like in Giraffa Titan, there's an abrupt transition in neural spine height and morphology. And since this happens between C6 and C7 in Giraffa Titan, the authors fix the position of the Sauro Poseidon cervicals as C5 to C8. This common characteristic suggested a close relationship between Sauro Poseidon and Giraffa Titan. In addition, the degree of pneumatization seen in Giraffa Titan is also present in Sauro Poseidon, being of a camelate internal structure, but taken to extremes. And these are just the main affinities for which Weddell et al. place both Sauro Poseidon and Giraffa Titan as sister taxa. I love this diagram, as it clearly illustrates the character states that define the separation from Titanosauridae, and then Sauro Poseidon from Brachiosaurus, now Giraffa Titan. This was an important reference for inferring the appearance of Sauro Poseidon. Another interesting idea is that the higher neural spines here increase the leverage of the dorsal musculature, suggesting strong muscle action into extension. On the other hand, the slender morphology of the cervicals anterior to this allow for more flexibility of the head and distal neck. Together, it suggested a shallow S-curve in neutral position. Now taking all of this into consideration, the paper offers a possible reconstruction based on Giraffa Titan. So we have the first iteration of a hypothetical Sauro Poseidon, and the earliest reconstructions based Sauro Poseidon on a larger, more elongate, and gracile Giraffa Titan. Weddell and Cifelli, 2005, revised the proportions of Sauro Poseidon somewhat and added a few more estimations. Based on a 9 meter neck of Giraffa Titan, they estimated Sauro Poseidon's at 11.25 to 12 meters, or 36.9 to 39.4 feet, so the neck alone could be as long as a T Rex. In this aspect, at least, our Sauro Poseidon totally agrees. Assuming a shoulder 6 to 7 meters, or 20 to 23 feet from the ground, and they estimated that Sauro Poseidon could reach 17 to 18 meters, or 56 to 59 feet. Now, part two is the description of Peluxisaurus by Rose in 2007. He described a large sample of sauropod material from early Cretaceous central Texas. You can freeze the video for an idea of all these remains. But suffice it to say, it's a lot, and it's significant. Now finding this material sufficiently different from other early Cretaceous sauropods, he named the genus Peluxisaurus. He found no cinepomorphies with Somphospondyli or derived characters of Titanosauria, and so nominated it as a Titanosauriform. Now, putting all this material together, Peluxisaurus could be reconstructed as seen here by the great Gunnar Bivens. I should note that this skeletal incorporates material that was described later in 2013 by Winkler et al., and importantly, contributes the sacral and pelvic girdle, further informing girth and carriage. Part 3 is the clincher where we head to 2012 and this paper by Demick and Foreman. They presented new material from the Lower Cretaceous Clovelly Formation, where they re-evaluated the Peluxisaurus material. They disagreed with the separation of Peluxisaurus from other material, and based on matching geological ages, shared autopomorphies, and no diagnostic differences, synonymized Peluxisaurus with Sauroposeidon. In addition, 
Their analysis resolves Sauro Poseidon as a basal somphospondylian and not a brachiosaurid. There's still some room for doubt over this proposal as it's based on referred material from both dinosaurs. However, Dr. Weddell himself thought it a reasonable idea. If this is correct, then the collective material we have of Paluxysaurus can all be referred to Sauro Poseidon. And upscaling for Sauro Poseidon, we then have this. Here, Gunnar Bivens has Paluxysaurus at 20.4 meters through the centra, and Sauro Poseidon as 30.6 meters, or 100.4 feet. As for how tall it got, this is a very erect reconstruction. As I've mentioned in the PNSO Marmonsesaurus video, height will also depend on variables such as the neck posture and where the shoulder girdle sits. Furthermore, its somphospondylian status makes the identification of the original vertebrae of C5 to C8 less certain, because while brachiosaurids tend to have 13 vertebrae, somphospondylians could have more. As you can see here, there are quite a few cervicals missing. With an average of a meter or so per vertebra, you can see the number used in a reconstruction will affect the maximum height. So the actual length of the neck is therefore unknown, and I wouldn't be too sticky about whether the neck is too short or even too long when admiring this model. In Gunnar's reconstruction, the estimated height is 20 meters tall. Because our model today is standing up, we don't have the satisfaction of seeing if this is indeed the case. Another thing, Paluxysaurus has a shorter forelimb relative to the hind limb compared to Brachiosaurus. This potentially lowers the overall height. So again, I wouldn't be too upset if the 1 to 35 scaled vertical reach doesn't work out to the often claimed 18 to 20 meters. There is a pity it's not in a more normal pose. I would love to compare it to Argentinosaurus as an illustration that the taller sauropod isn't necessarily more massive, as we see in this comparison pic. To sum up, that's pretty much how we've manifested Sauro Poseidon from the original series of four vertebrae. Again, I've glossed over many details, as the sauropod historians may notice. If we believe Paluxysaurus is the same, and the material we have for both of them are based on correct referrals, it's a real delight, because we have something far more complete compared to many large sauropods that seem to have been pulled out of someone's ass. Now that said, maximum vertical reach aren't fully carved in stone, but it's sure fun to speculate on. So that's it for now. In our final part, we'll look at some comparisons. I hope to get to that video soon. But for now, let me know what you think, and I'll see you in the next video.